Good morning and welcome to our service on this Sunday the 12th of May and it's the Sunday after Ascension. News from our church, St Thomas Beckett Church in Ramsey in Cambridgeshire. Not too much to report, we had a wonderful baptism yesterday. Our curate's daughter Vera was baptised in church and our previous minister Ian came out to do the honours. You see, he'd been looking after the curate during his time here. So, this morning's service. I think we're looking, really, we're going to have two readings, one from Acts and one from Gospel of John. And the first one, we're looking at some of our gifts. So thinking about the roles, for example, we have in different areas of our lives. We're all different, aren't we? We've got different temperaments, different gifts, different abilities. We've all got something to offer, either to other people and to God. And I do struggle a bit, I'm not sure about you, about whether or when I'm called to a particular role. I'm doing this, for example, <laughs> which is my particular role don't know I'm doing it and how do we look for potential in others and what sort of qualities our unique qualities our unique selling points do we bring to our own church communities I find it hard sometimes I sometimes think I'm so busy doing something is it the right thing is that what God wants me to do or is my ego taken over and I'm that busy just doing it because I think it needs to be done. A bit of an imponderable question. So let's draw together for our worship today. Generous God, we thank you for the good gifts we receive from you. Skills and abilities for opportunities to serve. We ask for the gift of discernment. We may know our own gifts recognize the potential in others. Amen. So let's begin with our first reading, which is taken from the first chapter of Acts. We think it's a bit strange how they dodge about in these readings. So we were on chapter four last week, now we're back to number one. Anyway, sorry, Acts chapter one, and we're going to be reading verses 15 to 17. And then we jump to verses 21 to 26. So if you want to grab your own Bible, pause the uh, video. I'll get on with our reading. So this is from Acts chapter 1 and I'm reading verses 15 to 17, first of all. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. And he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and he shared in this ministry. And then to verse 21. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph, or Basabbas, also known as Justus, and Matthias. And then they prayed. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic mystery, ministry. Judas left to go where he belongs. And then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. And so he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. 
I don't know, really, perhaps, what it might reveal about my character, but whenever the verses are omitted in the middle of a Bible reading, you just have to find out what those verses contained and try and work out, actually, how were they excluded. Today's reading that we've just heard from Acts appeared to move seamlessly from verses 17. You know, Judas has actually allotted his share in our ministry on to verse 21. So one of the men among us who's accompanied us throughout this time, da 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 da. But in between were the words we were meant to hear, describing how Judas acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all these bowels gushed out. He not eating breakfast. Now, when these words are omitted by the lectionary setters, because they contradict St. Matthew's account of Judas' death, were they omitted because sort of bowels gushing out? It was considered too gruesome an image to share? If it's the latter, I think they might have missed a trick. As I heard about a woman who volunteered to teach at a summer Bible school, she was horrified to discover she'd been a lot of a class of 12-year-old boys when she was more accustomed to teaching younger girls. Fortuitously, quite early on, someone discovered verse 18 of that Bible passage where Judas burst open in the middle and his guts pushed out. Oh, and the boys love this. And the woman discovered that by simply allowing someone to read the verse at the start of each session, we got the kids' attention for the whole duration. Anyway, let's recall what we know about Judas. There are several clues that he was one of Jesus' closest friends. The fact that his call to discipleship isn't recorded in the Gospels implies that he might have actually signed up before any of the others were there to witness it. His appointment as group treasurer suggests he was considered a man of integrity. And then let's think about the seating arrangements at the Last Supper, where we know that Judas was reclining immediately alongside Jesus, because Jesus passed him a piece of bread. All clues that Jesus, sorry, Jesus and Judas were close buddies. Hmm. Moving on. What else happens at the Last Supper? Jesus tells Judas, be quick about your business. Perhaps we imagine that spoken with an air of resignation. Quick about your business. But what if he's referring to precise instructions he's already given to the disciple he trusts most? After all, on arrival at Gethsemane, Jesus seems to wait hours in the event for something to occur. The disciples nod off several times, and Jesus prays the same prayer several times. He still waits. What? For Judas and the soldiers? It reads as though Gethsemane was the agreed rendezvous point, and all part of a predetermined plan, which, of course, you can say it was really. It was God's master plan to redeem the world by sending his son to die. Judas had a crucial role in that What's his problem. Judas never lived to appreciate the part he played. His story reminds us not to condemn others when we can't see the total picture, but also, perhaps more importantly, not to condemn ourselves either. We make a commitment to do God's will. Then we have to accept humbly. That we may never get to see how our allotted tasks played a small but vital part in the much bigger plan. I don't want to upset anyone with that. I just think it's an interesting take on Judas, whether he did agree to do that to fulfil God's plan. I just won't know. So also thinking about the early church. Does your church have a mission state? I think ours does. We have a big meeting. We talked a lot about what our purpose was as a church within the community we live in. 
I mean, here are some examples taken from churches in different parts of the world. We are a fellowship of believers demonstrating the love of God to all people, leading them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, accepting and assisting them in worship, Bible study, Christian service. Can't argue with that. Another example, the purpose of our church is summarised in a single sentence based on two key scriptures. We exist to reach up, that's worship, to reach out, evangelism, and to reach in, discipleship. And here's another example. The mission of our church is to proclaim the gospel to the world in worship, witness and work that all may know Jesus Christ personally. Inspired and guided by the love of God, Father, through the Lordship of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves, our time and our possessions. And a short one for a last one. Know Christ and make Christ known. Come and see, come and grow, come and share, go and serve. Well, does your church have anything like any of these? And if you were asked to write one for your church, what it would be? It's hard, actually, when we did ours. There's a lot of agonising. All of them, you look at the words and you think, oh, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you start to unpick it, you realise, actually, it's not just quite right, perhaps, for where your church is and where your congregation and community are. Ascension and the Sunday that we're in now is the time when the disciples receive their mission statement to spread the good news. Before they could begin to act out that mission statement, their first job was to learn to live without Jesus in their company. We read of the coming of the Holy Spirit. The age of the Spirit is about to dawn. God's Spirit is to be evident in fresh ways. The interest in the early part of the Acts is less in what actually happened to Jesus than what is about to happen in the lives of the earliest Christians. Those over whom the Holy Spirit would sweep across as Jesus leads, the Spirit-infused mission of the Church begins in earnest. 2,000 years on from that time, the mission of the church continues. If Jesus were to return today, here and now, perhaps in the guise of some sort of ecclesiastical auditor, could we offer him in terms of a sort of a millennial report? Would we be happy to meet him, to show him what we've done with the church? Would we be full of energy and enthusiasm? Come on, come and see what we've done. You're really going to love this. Or would our response of his visit be a bit more muted? Perhaps we would sort of delay things a little. Oh, oh maybe a cup of tea before we show you around. Or perhaps we'd be bothered by the idea of having to answer Jesus at all. It's him again. The church always seems to be defining its purpose, restating its mission, coming up with new ways of saying the same thing. There are so many churches, so many denominations who approach mission and evangelism and the teaching of faith in so many different ways. Just how many ways can there be to talk about mission? There's one thing that guides mission, one thing that's common to all churches, Holy Spirit. All churches are constantly trying to find it, to seek it, to know it. It's not a tangible thing. It's not like actually having a person to show you the way. Holy Spirit moves with a disconcerting unpredictability. Just when we think we know the Holy Spirit, it blows all our knowledge out of the window. The period between Ascension and Pentecost is a time when we look towards the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew the time would come for him to return to God. If he didn't, the disciples wouldn't continue to grow as they needed to. You can't be a missionary from the comfort of what you know. Jesus had to abandon his friends in real terms. 
even if he promised to be with them in their hearts and their minds. The disciples' mission was to go out and preach the good news to people everywhere. But they had a mission to undertake before that journey even began. Their first mission was to learn to live without Jesus. They had to leave behind their mentor. They had to step up and take responsibility. They had been led by Jesus and now they were to become the new leaders, teachers, the mentors. They had been like children. The disciples' first mission was to grow up. So a message there for us. So now I'd like us to look at our gospel reading that's set for today. This is taken from, from John, chapter 17, and verses 6 to 19. Jesus prays for his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I have given them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer. They are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still here in the world, so that they may have the full message of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself. They too may be truly sanctified. This is the word of our Lord. So we're coming towards the end of Easter, aren't we? And in that reading, Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples to carry on his work when he's no longer with them. And he doesn't pretend that life will always be easy for them, but he does offer protection. Do you hear what some of that protection was in the reading? Not have a look back and see what it is. What is the protection that Jesus is bringing? And I think we saw in the Acts reading, didn't we, the disciples have actually taken on that leadership, helped obviously by the Holy Spirit. And we know they go on to do great things. It is sad in this world sometimes that views, things that we say people can take offence at. And it can have very, very serious consequences. I was reading something during the weekend and came across this story. I don't actually remember it at the time it happened. It was from 2015. Um, a man called... Bajit Roy, I hope I've pronounced that properly. He was a prolific writer. He was a, a writer about secularism, 
and he condemned religious extremism and he had a blog, he was very active and he put lots on his blog and he lived in America, he was fairly safe. He supported the promotion and the protection of civil and human rights without a reliance on what he felt was religious dogma or a few of the world through a sort of religious lens. He, he returned to Bangladesh in 2015. He was going for a book fair with his wife. And unfortunately, he was packed to death by six Islamic extremists. And the police stood by and did nothing. Whether or not his blogs were entirely true or they were not very pleasant is beside the point. The mob who packed him to death clearly couldn't have believed in God, whatever religion they claimed to have trusted. No one of any faith who truly trusts that God is God can imagine that God needs this sort of protection. The faces were covered as if to emphasise that they knew they were wrong. The deluded violence, perhaps jealous rage at their own unbelief, perhaps they hack into their own self-loathing and fear of loss of control of their women and money. People no longer subscribe to the secure structures that a patriarchal religion draws up. Perhaps when Jesus play, prayed for the protection of his disciples, and we know that most of them will be killed for witnessing, he's asking God to protect them from such distortions and delusions and sectarianism and superiority, entitlement, religious jealousy and bitter disappointment must be motivated. Groups of murderers who go around in our world in the name of religion, bullying people, intimidating people. It's not Jesus' It's not God. So I'd like to just move us into prayer. So as we celebrate the day, live in a place when we can express our view and go to church, when we can glorify you without fear of intimidation. So as we celebrate that, let us pray together. Both heaven and earth are full of God's glory. God of love, we pray for unity in the church, and reconciliation and renewed vision. Heaven and earth are full of God's glory. As we recall the shouts of praise in heaven as Christ appears, we pray for all who help our neighbourhoods to flourish, those who support and care and help. Both heaven and earth are full of God's glory. We pray for all farewells and homecomings among our families and friends and for all who've lost touch with loved ones and long for reunion. Both heaven and earth are full of God's glory. Loving God, we pray for those who are full of tears and cannot imagine being happy again. We pray for those whose hearts are hardened, whose inner hurts have never yet been healed. We pray for wholeness and comfort and new life. Both heaven and earth are full of God's glory. We commend to your eternal love those we remember who have died. And we pray for those who, whose physical presence we miss. Both heaven and earth are full of God's glory. We praise and bless you, God of our making, for the way you draw us deeper 
into the meaning of life. Merciful God, accept these for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's just join together in saying the prayer that Jesus himself did. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And just then, in conclusion, a little story. One day, a church member approached the vicar and began to speak. Oh, God, God's told me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the vicar listened patiently and then replied, hmm, well, that's very interesting. And when I feel that God is telling me the same, perhaps we can move forward. I think stories like that are a little bit amusing, but there is a serious undertone. It isn't always easy to discern the way we should go, either in daily life or in church circles. And we can go it alone at our own peril. Most of us are going to have experienced sort of enthusiastic colleagues who put forward ideas without properly considering whether they're feasible or even desirable. And such folk might need a sort of a kindly mentor to draw them aside and point out some of those pitfalls and alternatives. In that reading from Acts, the disciples seem to understand the need of collaboration between people and God. No doubt they'd observed and spoken to likely candidates before shortlisting Joseph and Matthias. And before involving God in prayer and trusting to that process, of drawing lots. How do we respond if we feel that God might be calling us to something new in church or in the wider world? If our call is to a sort of formal, recognised form of ministry, whether it's lay or ordained, there's almost certainly a recognised process of discernment to go with it, selection, training, etc., etc., and such processes give assurance to the church's confidence and protection. That sense of calling isn't just ours alone, it belongs to the church as a whole. And of course, not everyone is called to be ordained or authorised ministry. Everyone, however, sorry, everyone is called to serve God, community of believers and their neighbours. We're not sure what our calling is. This step might be to assess our gifts and talents, to ask what those around us see in us, gifts of friendship, welcome, hospitality, artistic ability, computer skills, to name but a few. Just as important and necessary as those of a preacher. In the first place, Matthias and Joseph were willing to be called by God. Then they were prepared to participate in the selection process. And finally, they were obedient to the call of the church and accepted the roles they were assigned to. By the power of the Spirit, may we be able to assess our skills and talents and discern God's call. May we have the grace to seek the counsel of others. And may we joyfully accept our calling, whatever that may be. I think mine to be in the church walking. But at least I'm um, able to lead these services and um, keeping the church going during the interregnum. So may God be with you all this week. He bless you, keep you, hold you close to his heart. May you come safely through the week. And I might see you the following Sunday. So blessings to you all. Lots of love from Ramsey Church in Cambridgeshire. I'm Sean. Bless you.